Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this third gathering within the project Fragments of Repair. Welcome. My name is Witzke Maas and I am contributing curator and managing editor for publications at Bach Basis for Aktuelle Kunst in Utrecht. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to Bach Online on this occasion of the third gathering in the context of this multi-part project convened by Bach with artist Kada Atia and Decolonial Forum La Colonie. Welcome to all of you joining us virtually across many localities and several time zones. The project Frag Fragments of Repair is composed of three main fragments. The exhibition at Bac in Utrecht, La Colonie Nomade in Paris, which is a collective study program conceptualized by feminist and decolonial activist and educator Françoise Vergès, and the series of the gatherings, which consists of more, more or less fortnightly hybrid off and online conversations, lectures, screenings, and assembling together around the theory and practice of repair. The project has been conceptualized by Kada Atia and myself, and also through conversations with Françoise Vergès, Bach Artistic Director Maria Lavayova, and Bach Curator for Public Practice Rachel Rapes, and the Bach team. Thank you to everyone. Bringing this project together has indeed been and continues to be a multi-dimensional collective effort. However, I'd like to mention special words of thanks for the following people who have been involved in organizing and facilitating today's session from behind the scenes at Buck. Production is in the capable hands of Thomas Orbom and Head of Public Practice Hidde van Groningen with assistance by Nina Spa. The live stream is being taken care of by Ruben Hammelink and Daniel Lodeweges. And on behalf of Buck, I want to thank all collaborators of this project, all individuals and organizations who have made this project possible by generously sharing their resources of knowledge, time, energy, as well as funds. And with the latter, a special thanks to all financial support we received to bring this project into fruition. Now, just to give a short background about Fragments of Repair, it is a project pivoted around the notion of decolonial repair, which artist Kada Atia proposes as a tactic to engage with the urgencies of psychological health as a social phenomenon in a world wounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Injury, wound and repair have been key concepts across Kada Atia's practice especially in relation to the material and immaterial injustices of colonial domination that repercuss into the present. The current conditions bring these injustices into ever sharper relief while adding further psychic injuries through sustained uncertainty, social isolation, exhaustion, loss and fear. The project asks what pathways can repair not a return to past ways, but an itinerary shaped by a commitment to learning a decolonial art and politics of life, what trajectories of change then can decolonial repair offer to life in and out of the viral, social, and psychological pandemonium? Tonight, we will broach this question through a talk given by writer and critic Omedi Ocheng. Omedi is joining us via Zoom from Granville, Ohio, and after his talk, Omedi will then be joined by my colleague, Rachel Rakes, who is physically at Buck in the Buck Auditorium. I'm still in Berlin, not yet able to travel to Utrecht at this point. But Omedi Ocheng is a researcher, educator, and writer. He works as assistant professor of communication at Denison University in Ohio. Ocheng's areas of expertise include rhetorical theory and criticism, the rhetoric of philosophy and the philosophy of rhetoric, political theory and practice, and aesthetic praxis. Ocheng has published articles, among others, in International Philosophical Quarterly and Radical Philosophy. And quite recently, he published an article, Defeat the Police Beyond Defund or Community Control, for Spectre Journal, which I think is certainly highly recommended reading. Ocheng is the author of Groundwork for the Practice of the Good Life, Politics and Ethics at the Intersection of African and North Atlantic Philosophy from 2017. And I think his talk tonight will touch on some of the ideas discussed in this book. 
Ometi's talk is titled Utopianism, Anti-Utopianism and the Radical Politics of Chronotopian Ungovernability. Resonant with the notion of decolonial repair that the project Fragments of Repair invokes, the concept of chronotopian ungovernability constitutes a politics, an ethics, and an aesthetics of living in disrepair. It asks, what forms of life are possible in an earth wounded by capitalism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy? Ocheng's chronotopian ungovernability offers a reparative practice against the anti-utopian, uh, one could say a political nihilism of this time, which we see manifest in conservatism, neoliberalism, and religious fanaticism that hold no alternative to the present. Yet, neither is chronotopia a romantic utopianism fixated on future ideals that fail to come to terms with what it takes to collectively live and struggle within this historical conjuncture. Instead, chronotopia is a way of coming to terms with the actually existing constraints of history. And from within this coming to terms, to be able to cobble together experimental forms of life, struggle, and art. Following Omedi's talk, my colleague Rachel Rakes, but curator of public, of public practice, will join Omedi for a conversation. Rachel is co-editing currently with Maria Laviova and Jonathan Haysweg toward the Not Yet, a publication forthcoming this autumn published by Buck and MIT Press. She's organizing the exhibition research and discursive project on alternatives to progressive temporalities called No Linear Fucking Time, opening at Buck later this year. Rachel is also working through a research and curatorial collective called Counter Encounters on rethinking ethnographic ontologies with Laura Huertas Milan and Onyaka Igwe. So um, just a note of housekeeping. Um, this conversation and talk is being recorded uh, and will become available online at a later point. And for questions toward the last part of Omedi and Rachel's conversation, we'll um, be opening up to questions from the public. Please put your questions, and if you like, also your name into the Q&A Zoom function, and these will be relayed to Omedi and Rachel. Omedi, thanks so much for joining us. I now offer the virtual floor to you. Many, many thanks, Vitska, for that beautiful, generous invitation. I'm really thankful to back and very thankful to all those who've worked to make this possible, including Thomas. And I'm really looking forward to a conversation with Rachel later on. We live, I want to suggest, in a utopian and anti-utopian age. Of course, the most dominant feature of our world is the anti-utopian. And by the anti-utopian, I mean a conception of the world that holds, as Margaret Thatcher once said, that there's no alternative. Simply stated, this is the conviction that the current world is the best of all the options on offer. Anti-utopianism has many faces, but perhaps you will recognize a few in the following. One, nationalism. Two, neoliberalism three, reformism or electoralism, and four, humanitarianism. Now, utopianism is not as dominant as anti-utopianism, but it still holds a pull that's not without significance. And here I want to point out two, two faces of utopianism, and I'm happy to talk about this at length later on. Um, the first is philosophical utopianism, which here I mean the dominant assumptions in the academic humanities, I would argue, especially as seen in the North Atlantic, in North Atlantic political philosophy. And the second is activist utopianism. And I have, have in mind principally some of the dominant currents that have seized the left, especially in the United States and Europe right now, such as the Green, De Green New Deal in both the US and Europe, to proposals for community control of their police to the messianic investment in particular political figures. All of those I consider to be utopian. And um, I would argue later on, um, I'll be happy to expand on what I mean by that. So against anti-utopianism and, and utopianism, I want to then to posit an alternative account, one which drawing from Mikhail Bakhtin's 
I call the chronotopian. In forms of time and of the chronotope in the novel, Bakhtin advances the idea of the chronotope, which he defines as the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships, denoted by the term chronotope. I turn to Bakhtin's concept primarily because it insists on the connectedness or the imbrication of space and time across planetary scales. But unlike Bakhtin, my account posits not only a mode of reading, but also one of agency. If we are to start with a chronotopian notion of time and space, we begin not with blueprints for a great world, a great future, but rather with what the great writer and thinker Stuart Hall described as their historical conjecture. That conjecture consists in a clear-eyed view of the most enduring structures of exploitation, oppression, and annihilation operative today. I want to articulate at least four of those below, which I consider to be both uh, constraints, but also, I would argue, offering certain kinds of opportunities. First, economically, there's likely an irre irreversible decline in growth and profits under late cap capitalism. Ecologically, planetary life will, in will be increasingly nasty, brutish and short as the consequences of the capitalist scene become even direr. Politically, even the veneer of democratic politics that used to be the guiding ideology in the empires of the North Atlantic world are being brutally ripped apart to reveal the ethno-nationalist and ethno-religious structures of these polities. And socially, the loci of socialization, relationships, and meaning are being shattered. So I want to just very briefly talk a little bit about those, uh, those, those formations um, before going on to my substantive remarks on, on what I think we, we, how we ought to respond to them. So first, regarding the economic conjecture. Thomas, please show image one slide. Capitalism is now the hegemonic economic order in much of the world. But we are witness to a precip precipitous decline of economic growth in capitalist economies and a corresponding fall in investments. What are the implications of this stoppage, this, this shrinking, uh, in this, this capitalist decline, I want to identify at least two. If in the past it was intelligible to think of the capitalist subject as the laborer in the factory floor, or for some people, the peasant or the farm worker, we now should reckon with the, with the typical life under capitalism as what the cultural historian Michael Denning referred to as wageless life. In every country, an overflow of people deemed surplus populations, unemployed, often imprisoned or homeless, refugees, immigrants, or stateless people, many forced to brave high seas, deserts, and mountains so as not to starve, and then subjected to a reign of terror in the places they land in uh, by state and non-state institutions. Secondly, the second implication I would argue is we should expect an even larger bifurcation between what the sociologist Michael Mann described as the despotic versus the infrastructural dimensions of the North Atlantic state. On the one hand, the despotic dimensions of the state will be ramped up to horrendous levels. On the other hand, um, we should expect that the infrastructural dimensions of the state, roads, bridges, energy grids, buildings, plumbing and ventilation and air distribution systems will decay. We should expect then to see entire neighborhoods, even cities abandoned by the nominal governments that should provide services to these cities, even us, these state governments or these institutions ramp up brutal policing and even as we expect um, increasing wars of attrition internationally. Second, the political conjecture. Thomas, this short image two slide, please. The world is under the sway of empires. The dominant empire, the US empire, aided by its satellites across around the world, styles itself a democracy. 
one of the most important implications to my mind of this political conjuncture is that democracy, which in the North Atlantic world has historically been more of an ideological weapon than an actual practice, will be even much more than it is already an utterly bankrupt, even despotic practice. We should expect elections whose only outcomes will be the victory of fascism. Third, the social conjuncture. Please show image three slide, please. By the social, I mean here the networks of association that are at once the loci of socialization and wellsprings of meaning. This includes neighborhoods, schools, places of worship and workplaces. At the heart of the metropolitan capitalist countries under neoliberalism's long war of attrition, the social has been pulverized. The wealthy are now increasingly fortified behind gated communities, condos, and incorporated towns. The poor are sealed in ghettos, barrios, bonlieus, and housing projects. The norm, as Mike Davis has shown in his book, Planet of Slums, is a world in which the poor are sealed in shanty towns, garbage hills, ghettos, barricades. Meanwhile, National borders increasingly made literal by walls and razor sharp wire keep others out. Refugee camps numbering tens of thousands are everywhere. So what are the implications of this? One, that the conditions for forging solidarity are thin, brittle, and often shattered. The historical spaces where social solidarity were forged, such as the factory floor, the neighborhood schools, or public parks, are segregated, inaccessible under, or inaccessible under surveillance or disappearing. Those who would build social solidarity have to do so in the refugee camp, in the high seas, in prisons, in informal settlements, and in occupied territory. Secondly, the second implication is that the questions of reproduction, care work, and interdependence, especially work directed at the most vulnerable, the young, the elderly, the neurodivergent, the sick, the poor, is at the very heart of a praxis of emancipation. And third, that reckoning with affects, especially affects of nihilism, of fear, of rage, is a critical dimension of revolutionary insurgencies and social movements. And lastly, the ecological conjuncture. Please show slide four. Climate change is rendering large swaths of the world uninhabitable, cutting across the economic, the political, and the social. There are many implications that follow from this, but two are immediately visible. First, planetary life will be rendered even more precarious, far nastier, more brutish, and abhorrently short. And secondly, radical social movements have always organized with a, lo a long view. That long view must now increasingly reckon with ongoing extinction that we have indeed a short window of time. So toward that end then, having sort of articulated these conjectures, I suggest a practice of chronotopian ungovernability as a provisional, contingent, transitional, and radical response to planet, planetary crisis. And I say this particularly in view of the idea that if we don't contend with those conjectures, ours will be a very utopian practice in a very pejorative sense. And then by chronotopian ungovernability then, I mean a constellation of social formations, a repertoire of practices, of artistic and creative practices, performances and artifacts, and a medley of strategies and tactics constitutive of freedom. And governability is a spectrum of practices. It does not name a single kind of thing, an act or belief. Here, I just want to highlight at least four formations of ungovernability. The first is political and social forms of organizing in horrifically tyrannized institutions. Please show slide five, please. By horrifically tyrannized institutions, I mean for example, the slave plantation, prisons, refugee camps, and settler colonial places such as Gaza in Palestine. In her path breaking 
book out of the house of bondage, historian Tavolia Glimpf brilliantly tells the story of how the slave household as a place of how the slave household as a place in which white women brutally sought to break black women and thereby render them utterly obedient to their command. Such was the fierce fight back by enslaved black women that a common refrain from white women was that they were ungovernable. The second form of ungovernability refers to a spectrum of practices aimed at articulating forms of living. Please show slide six. The common thread that ties these practices involves experiments in living that are either involuntary or voluntary. Um, they, they try to sever themselves from the state. Involuntary, involuntary forms of ungovernability take place when groups of people or movements organize to live together due to the abandonment of the places they live in by the governments. And here I want to sort of echo some of what uh, Professor Gilmore has articulated about spaces of abandonment. In many parts of the world, the government has either never provided any services or has ceased to provide any services to, to those places. There's no electricity, no water or sewage system. Garbage is not collected, mail is not delivered, school buses don't pick up children for school. In the absence then of state services, communities gather together to cobble together forms of living. But these experiments of living can also be voluntary and intentional. For example, homeless people squatting in vac vacant apartments in Barcelona or homesteaders establishing gardeners, gardens in inner city neighborhoods that are lacking fresh groceries or people organizing community, community public safety groups and agreeing not to call the police in times of emergencies. The third form of ungovernability involves direct attacks of political, economic, and cultural structures through acts of vandalism, riots, burning of police stations, and random economic forms of sabotage. Please show slide seven. But even here, these practices form a spectrum. At one end are actions made to confront the state so that it can deliver services through acts of social disruption. But at the, at the other end of the spectrum are movements in which insurgents don't make any particular demands. Their actions are dedicated to destroying the infrastructures of capitalism, white supremacy and patriarchy, using any and all means, looting, starting fires, barricades and blocking off roads and so much more. We have examples of this, obviously, for instance, um, in South Africa under apartheid from uh, in the 80s, there was a call uh, by the NC for ungovernability. And uh, we also have examples of this, obviously, from the United States last year, for instance, in Min Minneapolis, when people, um, when people fought back against state oppression. The fourth forms of the fourth form of ungovernability are creative and aesthetic forms of ungovernability. I have in mind here art making and craft making and critical responses to these arts and crafts that are often part of the everyday and find their realization in the street, in the fields, in the wake, in the factory floor, and in the prison. Examples include the community and theatrical acts put together from below by peasants, working class communities and the wageless that were given witness in Augusto Boal's theater of the oppressed. The conceptual art, for instance, of Adrian, Adrian Piper and the scenes of festivity, song and ungovernability that were witnessed during the Sudan uprising in 2018. And also I'm thinking about, for instance, the Situationist International in the, um, that articulated forms of um, artistic, creative, and governability. So to close then, chronotopian and governability then constitutes a politics of living in disrepair, disrepair against the determinism of anti-utopianism anti and against the voluntarism of utopianism. Chronotopian and governability 
offers a praxis of coming to terms with the actually existing constraints of history and structure. And then precisely drawing on the affordances strewn around to cobble together forms of life, of struggle, and of art. Second, chronotopian and governability is a radical insofar as it seeks to engage time and space at concurrent and yet incommensurable scales. And sometimes, indeed, we need to recognize the scales of time and space as contradictory. These are ecological space and time, socioeconomic space and time, ethical space and time, existential and aesthetic. The account of time articulated here and the count of space that emerges is neither linear, sequential, nor is, nor is it cyclical or repetitive. Here I'm just echoing again Kada's wonderful articulation of what repair means, not as a return to a sort of prelapsarian past, um, but really as a sort of an account of how um, we, cannot, we cannot completely wipe away history. History erupts, trauma erupts from the past, okay? Rather, we are sort of reckoning with time and space as contradictory, eruptive, and tensional. And third, chronotopian and governability insofar as it is exper experimental, provisional, transitional, and contingent insists on a radical imagination. An important dimension of chronotopian art making and craft making then is art and crafts in action. That is, arts and crafts that are folded in the everyday, that are attuned to movements from below, and that offer proleptic hints that another world is not only possible, it is here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amedi. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you uh, about this and kind of carry forward some of the ideas. I, I want to start maybe returning to terms a bit just to um, give the audience more of, a, more of a sense of what we're talking about uh, with the idea of the chronotopian uh, and the idea of governability, especially vis-a-vis -vis the planetary, because, because I think in both cases with both of these terms and how they go together, they're kind of dependent on uh, planetary thinking or the idea of the planetary. So to go back to um, some of the examples that you were giving around uh, anti-utopianism and utopianism, so with anti-utopianism, um, in this case, uh, say right now, we're talking about things like uh, nationalism, neoliberalism, uh, this idea of humanitarianism as a kind of fix, these kinds of things. And with utopianism, uh, the couple of examples you gave are like the, such as the Green New Deal um, or, the, or community, the idea of community police control. It struck me that in, in the examples for both and how, how we're looking at both of these things right now, uh, it often comes down to kind of a failure of a political imaginary or a kind of pre-foreclosure. Uh, so in the sense of, say, something like a Green New Deal, we're looking back, the, the imaginary goes as far as the New Deal, uh, which is something that, you know, that we would, we would hope to not be looking for, right? That's not the projection, that's not, that's not, the, you know, that's not what we want to be living in, given what that came out of and the various kinds of in, in, inequities uh, that, were still, that were still ongoing in this time, right? Um, and the idea of uh, the idea of police community control, uh, which kind of elides the elides the actual the, the actual power of the police, and so kind of uh, lacking an imaginary to get a sense of kind of the the full picture of this. Um, and it, it sort of in, in in some ways it kind of harkens back to to the to the to the idea of anti utopianism itself, where there are all kinds of foreclosures where anti utopianism is a foreclosure based on, say, oppression or cynicism or nihilism, and utopianism is a foreclosure based on more, say, naivete or resignation. Um, and so with that, I, I'm hoping that maybe you can expand on what chronotopianism does that's different, that is that like has that has a different imaginary, a political imaginary. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think you've stated it very well. That I, I do think that there's a there is a sort of umbilical cord, or there's a way in which anti-utopianism is deeply 
tied to utopianism and vice versa. Um, that they emerge from a, uh, a, this historical moment, um, or uh, which is precisely a question of the imagination. Um, I suppose one entry, one entry into this is um, is a question of. Um, I, I want to sort of I'm 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 moving dialectically between two poles here, and one one pole is that. Um, we have to come to terms with the weight of history. Okay, we have to come to terms with the weight of history. And th that weight of history means that we, we are attentive to not just um, what can be done, but, but what has to be reckoned with. And my critique a lot of anti-utopian, uh, of, of utopianism, in a sense, my sense, of, my sense is that um, a lot of people that I respect and love and I think of as comrades, I think of them as, my, um, as people that I've learned a lot from, um, already know the critique of, the critique of anti-utopianism. We are sort of all ranged against the idea that this is all that there could be. Um, but many people that I respect and love also still think that, um, for instance, are, have deeply invested in certain electoral outcomes in the United States. So every sort of four years, there's sort of a, a movement like let's go in, let's let's elect somebody to 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 change this. Or if that's not the case, uh, I still they still think only in terms of the political. So in my view, one of the sort of arguments I have against, for instance. Um, I would argue community control of the police, but also I would argue even the con even um, the Green New Deal is that their range of vision, their range of the space of action is principally and almost wholly dedicated to the political. How can we change the political structures? And then if we change the political structures, it's going to lead to economic change. And I want them to be attentive as well to sort of this overarching political economy in which we are in particularly of capitalism, and that um, we are not going to rev, uh, rev up the economy at will, right? We're not just going to sort of like say, oh yeah, we're going to have this Green New Deal and at the same time we're going to have, um, at the same time we're going to have economic growth. Uh, capitalism is just going to like, you are not going to lose so much because you know, economic growth is, is not going to be uh, shut down by by all these jobs that will be emerging. I, I think that we have to come to terms with also the sort of limits of capitalism and also the sort of affects that that, that, that incites. So part of it then is to demand a, 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 a wider vision of not just the political, but the economic, the social, and the, um, the ecological. Um, but I think part of it is sort of to also sort of come to terms with um, with constraints as well. Um, and that um, we are not going to sort of leap into that moment that we want. Um, and and I, I, I see a lot of utopian moves as an attempt to leap. They are very, they are very sort of, they offer a lot of detail on what is going to happen after a certain kind of revolution or change, but not enough, I think, about what it means to contend right now with the actually existing um, moment, and and right now for me, I would I would argue um, that calls for looking at how communities, how space, places in the refugee camps, in Gaza, in West Bank, and uh, in prisons in the United States, and so on, how people are working in those spaces um, to uh, articulate forms of exp of living, um, but also. Um, of of uh, pushing back, fighting against, struggling against um, governability, go governance. And just to push on that a bit further before uh, talking more about governability, um, 
how, where would you place your thinking on chronotopianism in terms of, um, say, movements or modes of thinking, like, like speculative fictions or uh, Afrofuturisms or various kind of future thinking? Does it have a, a role? Uh, does it have a role in this more kind of more grounded, um, yeah, this more, this more grounded, more sort of acceptance of, I, I believe uh, you said recently in a podcast, we should never think of that politics is ever going away. Even in some, even even in some utopia that could be, there's still there's always politics. Yes, yes, and and then I I think that I suppose um, I'm struck by on the one hand what I think of as very generative dimensions of, for instance, Afro Afrofuturism, um, especially for me uh, when it comes to the the aesthetics of Afrofuturism, especially, I want to argue, sort of art and crafts that emerge from these forms of speculation. Um, we are going to have to um, experiment, and we are going to have to sort of not think that, um, even as I talk about all this, uh, I want to be careful to say that, obviously, part of it is uh, the unknown, and to sort of be able to live with 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 lack of certainty and and therefore um, I think arts arts and crafts are sort of the the spaces or are the forms in, that help us to to experiment but also to um, yeah to to sort of live with the contradictions and live with with uncertainty. So for me, what's most generative about um, certain kind of Afrofuturist thought is insofar as they invite us toward this kind of speculative thought, um, thought that is still attuned to the empirical, but doesn't stop there with the empirical. Try so sort of say that there's, there's there are these possibilities of rearranging, re reigniting, um, sometimes destroying, uh, <laughs> destroying what, what appears to be just natural. Uh, and and hopefully from that can emerge something else. Um, that I don't want also to, however, um, think that art and artistic practice is just dedicated in terms of the formal artistic practice. That's why I'm sort of I'm very interested in forms of artistic practice that are folded into the everyday. So one of the things that emerged, for instance, um, in the Sudan uprising in 2018, which I found uh, really uh, amazingly invigorating was that in many spaces, in encampments that a lot of um, people who are rebelling against the military regime in Sudan, in those encampments, for instance, in Khartoum, there was an area of festivity. There was people were putting on like uh, dance and and um, plays and and uh, there was just an air there of creating art, even as they were sort of basically laying siege to um, to the military government. And so, sort of this, there's something that that emerges in in these kinds of encampments that. Um, that cannot be foreseen, that you don't sort of say, I am creating something. It's, it's, it emerges together with other people. And so I'm, I'm interested in that sort of constitutive moment when something new is emerging in the doing of it that you don't know about before it emerges. And to that extent then, um, I want to say that, uh, yeah, I'm, I want to sort of see this as, I, I want to see art and art crafts as, a, as, as forms of action as well, as ways in which we remake ourselves. And, and um, if, if I've been open to Afrofuturism in the speculative, um, I'd love to see that kind of spirit um, extended to the everyday um, and extended to uh, to thinking about how it's imbricated in forms of struggle and forms of um, rioting, looting, um, vandalism um, that push back against state oppression. <laughs>
Yeah, we, when we talked uh, about a week ago in preparation for this, um, I, I brought up a conversation I got to have recently with Walida Imarisha, a uh, writer and writer and activist and thinker who works a lot on abolition and, um, and works on this idea of visionary fiction. And she was talking about this uh, collapsing of a timeline that uh, she was able to witness last year um, around, uh, around Minneapolis, around, around the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, where suddenly what seemed to be something that would be 30, 50 years in the future, a discussion of even community control of the police, defunding the police, or possibly ab abolition, was suddenly seemingly on the table, or it was in the air, it was, on, it was on Twitter, it was mentioned in the news, and that through some kind of you know, combination of the groundwork that ha having had happened and, some, and, and a bit of dreaming and even thinking that that could happen in 50 years, along with just this you know, intensive effort of people on the ground, which is largely un, you know, sort of unseen or un, un, unrecognized. Um, yeah, she phrased it as like the timeline collapsed. Mm. And I guess maybe that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, bri that's brilliant. Um, yeah, for that reason, um, I suppose that that really attunes well with my sense of why we ought to be, um, why we, we ought to be, uh, we, why we ought to think of the utopian, not only as future, futuristic and, and um, that, that, that utopia in the pejorative sense is a sort of notion of the future of something that is not now here will be there then. And I'm interested in, again, uh, uh, rescuing or recuperating, uh, why, that, why I'm talking about the chronotopian is an emergence, a, a form of constitu constituting something now in the present. Um, that, and that really uh, resonates with me because that's that notion of the collapse of time, that, more, that notion that of, of, of the making of that. I'm, I'm here thinking, for instance, of um, Walter Benjamin and the idea of how his critique on the philosophy of history, when he critiques um, the, the social democrats. And he says that, um, with the, yeah, one of his problems with the social democrats was that they, um, he argues that he says that, for instance, Marx secularized messianic time. And the problem is that the social democrats then made that, made time into um, an ideal, made, made certain kind of uh, principles into an ideal, where, and then sort of uh, by, making, by making those principles of time into these ideals, um, they have consigned us always to the anteroom of history. We are always waiting. We are always waiting for, um, for, for, for real history to begin. And Benjamin is sort of, I think, interested in uh, a certain compression or a certain kind of um, opening where um, messianic time or whatever you want to call it, I'm critical of ideas of messianic, but, but in my understanding of it as um, that, that we can seize the moment now when we, we can be open to seeing uh, that collapse. Um, we don't have to wait um, for this future time to arrive. It can come now. And that I think is revealed the most, I think it's revealed particularly clearly um, in those moments of um, real like confrontation, those moments of, of uh, fierce ungovernability. For instance, what happened in, in Minneapolis, okay? There was that collapse in that moment when um, people lived without the police or people made the police retreat. And, you know, there was this moment of, uh, of the seizure of freedom, you know, a, a world without police was existed in Minneapolis at a, at a certain moment in time. And I wonder then if 
um, how that can be made possible. Um, how uh, like we people abolish the police in that moment. Very nice. Uh, that's a, a nice segue for me to ask you a bit more about ungovernability, especially in terms of the planetary. I I feel like a lot of a lot of examples that we might turn to when thinking about ungovernability have to do with um, these bursts, more kind of localized you know, bursts um, of, of rabble rousing, of resistance. Um, but when you apply a kind of planetary thinking to ungovernability, what happens there or how does that happen? How does that come about? Mm -hmm. A good question. I think um, it does mean for me that um, we have to think transversally. Um, if universalist, if, if universalist thinking has always been a form of the God's eye view, um, we want to be critical of that notion. But we cannot also we can also not so reduce our our forms of living and practices to the nation state or only to a certain kind of singular identity. Um, we have to start thinking about how. Um, Palestine is um, deeply, deeply connected and deeply uh, part of the struggle against um, anti-blackness in the United States anti and, and the abolishing of, of the police in the United States. We have to think about um, how, uh, how to coordinate then those, those, those struggles. Um, so um, I see I see that work as on the one hand work that's ongoing and work that's already there, right? I I I, I think that we 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 don't have to to make that possible insofar as um, there are a lot of social movements that are already working across um, on us on a planetary planetary level through various blockades and some, sometimes that can also doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, it, you know, when somebody, for instance, stops the pipeline in the United States, um, obviously we know that that's an international, um, that's, that's a, a planetary um, social movement. It's, it's not necessarily the case that um, one has to leave where they are and go somewhere else. Um, but but even, even as I'm saying that, I'm saying that that work always has to be continually renewed, expanded, uh, worked with. And maybe that's also one of the critiques I had as well for um, one, uh, one dimension of uh, the utopian thinking that a lot of the pros proposals I see tend to be deeply nation thinking forms of like you're thinking about them in terms of borders. And it's not, it's not surprising to me that just as some people are talking about proposal for the Green New Deal, they are also ramping up a new Cold War with China. Those two things go together. And uh, resistance movements, insurgent movements, have to absolutely try to destroy, smash those, those notions of, um, of nation thinking or, or very narrowly vulgar forms of um, identity thinking. So um, yeah. I see it's ongoing. I, I wonder about um, how those, those can be coordinated. Um, and um, I see opportunities because, you know, capitalism is now more than ever about circulation. And just imagine what happened, for instance, with Ever Given and the sort of when it ran aground or when it got stuck in the Suez Canal. People have to th start thinking about then how we can break this, the movements of, um, we can break certain movements, but facilitate such other movements, like refuse the walls and the borders. Um, at the same time, uh, bring about the grinding to a halt of certain capitalist um, formations. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you would agree, but I, I think we are seeing several glimmers of that already um, on the level on levels of discourse, but also things like 
um, this morning, um, this, this uh, photograph of a mural in, in Gaza of George Floyd was going around, right, of solid, solidarity with, with Gaza and Minneapolis. Uh, or a rally that's happening tomorrow in London that is, you know, mutually for Colombia and Gaza, right? And so it's like just instantly the troubles are connected. And um, yeah. I wonder if that's also, if that also has something to do with a generalized sense that um, while there's plenty to do on local levels, um, in terms of kind of understanding the limits of utopianism, because there is no, there is no longer an outside, there's no, uh, most of us have a sense now because of climate change, because of so many multiple intersecting crises, that there's no particular state that's that great. You know, there's no particular place where we can go, you know, there's no island. Um, so spatially speaking, you know, apart from the time thing, um, there is no outside unless you're, you know, unless you want to like be Elon Musk and go to Mars. Um, but that's, ob that's obviously a whole other foreclosure of imagination, right? Absolutely, yes. And, and one of the things I've been interested in, in looking at, um, although let me start first by saying it warms my heart to see that, um, to see when, I, when, when people sort of engage across those levels. So it warms my heart to know um, that people in Gaza uh, see the solidarity, that know that, we, that the solidarity with, with them in those spaces. Um, I want to sort of say that, um, yeah, I am interested in that one, one of the reasons why capitalism is so durable, I think, why white supremacy, white supremacy is so durable, why patriarchy is so durable, is precisely because it imposes certain double binds, I would argue. You know, um, it's one of those double, double binds is that um, something can be, can look progressive on the national front. Something can look like empower, empowering in the national front. It, it may not be national, it can be even institutional front. For instance, you can get certain benefits, all right? And, and that can be a, a very good thing, right? There can be some, some, some progressive movements by, for instance, a trade union can win certain concessions from an employer that are absolutely good. You uh, know, but it it's it can be articulated and it's often articulated within capitalism precisely through the expropriation, exploitation, exclusion of others. Such that what appears to be a, a good progressive win on one front is absolutely horrendous on another front. And that those kinds of bind double binds is precisely what I'm interested in thinking about in in, in at the at the, at the level of organization and at the level of resistance, right? How, how do you persuade people who have a pretty good, sort of have, have secured certain um, benefits, for instance, at the union level? And remember, whenever the police sort of, whenever we talk about like abolishing the police and so on, we often talk about, for instance, police unions in the United States and how one of the ways that they, they they sort of impose certain rules at the at the local level at least why certain people don't want to go there in terms of attacking those unions is precisely because some of that is connected to public certain certain um, had one had one um, concessions public uh, union concessions that apply not only to the police but um, apply to other levels and some people don't want to touch that. Because they know that if we go there, it could mean the end of um, other had won sort of tasks or had won uh, concessions won for teachers and 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 firefighters and so on. So I suppose at the I yeah I at the local level one of the questions that always sort of nags at me is. Um, these double binds of capitalism, double binds of white supremacy and patriarchy, um, and that the work of resistance is also the work of trying to figure out a way of unraveling these double binds, of making, um, making it possible for us to say that there, there are ways in which there are certain losses that that 
will be that you, you will have precisely in order that we have a, a more equitable and therefore greater gains elsewhere. It's a hard question though, and it has to be approached sort of with an eye to both that local and those that sort of planetary context. And I, I don't have an answer for it. Um, but a lot of organizing runs aground precisely because um, it's, it's very hard to make a case for a certain kind of loss in order to sort of think about what it will mean then for us to, um, to live, all of us everywhere to live freely. Shall we take some questions for the chat or should I go with one more, Witzka? Okay, so just to uh, continue on uh, with your, I wanted to keep talking a little bit about the police example because you recently wrote this really important article in Spectre um, about the, it almost, it almost seems, uh, it, it, almost, it could sound reactionary in a sense of like, we can't, you know, there is no reform of police, we can't have, we can't defund, we can't have community control. But it's, um, it's about the fact that it kind of can't be overstated just how much power the police and the police have in the US, how much control, um, how much of, how much, yeah, how much military control, social control, um, that it's, it's this thing that, um, yeah, that it, that it, it's almost sort of unbelievable because we, we don't want to believe it or can't believe it. And so the idea of, of reforming that or placing or placing demands on it becomes kind of in, in, incommensurate or almost impossible. And I thought of that as kind of a microcosm for your thinking in general about how to resist. Maybe you can talk about that a bit more. Yes, I, I think I, I, I understand completely. I've already been told by several people that it does that it's an reactionary argument, um, and and that it's it's not a helpful argument. And I understand the reason why people think that, uh, or why some comrades think that, particularly um, because um, there's a lot of work that has gone into some of this. And I'm not, I don't want to discuss. I think that there are wins, actual practical wins. Um, that, for instance, the defund movement has won, and and I don't want to discount it as not something that is um, important. Um, I suppose my 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 answer will be that I I often think structurally, and even if you can secure certain means, um, um, we know, for instance, there are certain reforms. Not all reforms have been just useless. I mean, there are certain reforms that have won something. Um, I, I suppose I could I can argue that if you look at the empirical data, there is um, there is some reason to think that um, at certain local levels, not all, but at certain local levels, having more say black police officers has um, led to lower levels of brutalization. But it's not a structural change at all. We know that it's not a structural change. And if you really want to start thinking structurally, then you're thinking that. What will it take to actually um, bring about the end of policing? Um, even as we sort of are aware that there are these movements, I think that um, my critique, for instance, of community control of the police is maybe a Fanonian argument that even if you were to secure it, it will not give you what you think you, you get. Like, even if you sort of, even if nominally, a lot of um, countries, a lot of spaces in the United in in Africa secured nominal independence. They sort of, uh, you know, they they had some certain kinds of um, that kind of direct control by by colonialists uh, was was fought back and the the, the colonialists pulled out. Um, the structures that were left were not such that they could secure actual um independence um and i would argue then that if we think that in those terms then um we have to appreciate what the police are like we have to appreciate not just their power but also uh, the spectrality of the police as an institution and, you know that the idea that it's deeply bound up beyond this, just the police it's institution itself, the, it's a notion of policing in general and policing in general as a white supremacist um, 
performance that that implicates and that that uh, drafts and conscripts all manner of people across the country, across the United States, to be police, um, to 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 function as police, and therefore, what will that demand? Um, I don't think it demands thinking in terms of localities controlling the police, because even if you were to secure that, those are not enough and powerful enough to actually check the police. We are going to have um, systems that look as if um, there is some kind of civilian control of the police that, are, that aren't actually civilian control of the police. And yeah, so to look then for those kind of systems and structures, for me right now, I see nothing but um, a dedication to to ungovernability in, in all its different forms That's, that can take different sort of spectrums. I know that, for instance, um, I think the sociologist Alex Vital once wrote to me about this. He talked about uh, a neighborhood in North Philly that, um, in Philly, I, I forget, uh, whether it was not or something, but this neighborhood in North that that wasn't getting any services. They weren't getting any services, and what they did then was they just uh, um, set they just sort of uh, set cars on fire. They made they made the space they made it impossible to walk to to drive through that neighborhood. Such that um, the 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 local government had to be responsive to some of the the services. Um, had to like start picking up garbage and to like provide um, various services. Um, so there's the ungovernability as sort of securing certain services from the state. And then there's also another spectrum, which is a complete and utter sort of opposition, um, including opposition that is often derided as irrational, but that we know is are not is anything but irrational, um, including of course um, these kinds of um this kinds of um sort of fight back so so yes i i think if we keep in mind sort of that fanonian point then we are sort of attentive to the idea that it's not simply winning but what that winning establishes um and for me then i think um there yeah there has to be uh an unflinching, complete refusal um, uh, that refuses any idea of, that try, tries to shatter the idea of policing even um, and, and the practice of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exceeding demands and going right to refusal, right? Um, we have some questions from the audience, so I'm going to turn to them. Um, Okay, the first one. I was wondering, Omeri, if you could elaborate a little on the difference in the conception of time with regards, uh, on the one hand, the linear conception in anti-utopian and utopian imaginations, and the other non-linear conception in the chronotopian, um, perhaps in relation to how the coordinates of time, in, of time and space are connected in the chronotopian and its relationship to the past, which, as you said, needs to be reckoned with uh, and is not reckoned with, say, properly in an anti-utopian imagination. So maybe just taking uh, a bit further what we began speaking about in terms of the temporality of chronotopianism. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I suppose if we think about the dominant ways of time, I think, um, even if this has been critiqued, it still remains. Um, it still remains. Um, I would argue one of the most dominant. Certainly, the idea of time as progress. Um, and maybe Rachel, you can actually speak to that question better than I. I could. I know it was directed at me, but I know that your projects are sort of responsive to that sort of critique of of this time. So, and if you look at it, um, we are living still. Um, in um, idea of time as progress, time as sequential 
um, time as this movement toward the the sort of something and and sometimes you can see it not necessarily sort of articulated um explicitly but if you look at how people think about for instance elections in the united states you can see how that's absolutely still holding people that idea of looking forward to the next election and and elections are setting their rhythms for resistance and setting the the coordinates of of resistance um and what is that but a certain idea of time as this chronology, empty time as just movement toward this. Um, and what, what I'm interested in as well then is um, what are emergent right now? Um, what are emergent right now uh, uh, in fascist time? Um, fascist time and um, or, or yeah, anti-political time. Sometimes some people critique the idea of fascism because uh, maybe it is it doesn't in, engage all forms of political formations, uh, all anti-political formation, formations across the world. So we want to think not only then of European, uh, the European scene or North American scene, but also what it would mean to start thinking about uh, places in the global South that are right now under the sort of um, under the movement of anti-political times, people like Modi in in India and um, um, or or um, in Brazil, um, and uh, I would argue places like Kenya and so on that are uh, anti-political spaces. And what kind of ideas of time is articulated in those moments? Um, a lot of it, one can argue is um, a certain mythical idea of um, recovery of, of, of certain lost, a lost patriarchy, a lost um, maybe racial regime, um, and maybe even one can argue a lost religious um, or a threatened religious ideal um, that one sort of goes back to get. Um, and and therefore, that chronotonic time is challenging not only this linear notions of time, but also um, this this refusal to um, this this sort of attempt to restore something that restore or bring back something that really never existed, um, and and I think that is bound up. I think one of the reasons that anti-political systems are really um are really like uh they, they they secure at a certain level they do secure um not only not only sort of elite support but they, they come sometimes secure support from 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 um other sort of larger populations is because they can tap into certain forms of uh felt woundedness or felt lostness um, in one of my pieces, I once talked about this, that um, um, nihilism sort of emerges, nihilism is, doesn't refer to um, meaninglessness. It doesn't refer to sort of an idea of, uh, of, of life as meaningless. Rather, it's much more um, an idea that a sort of denial of reality, a denial of a certain kind of the, the, the reality of others, the reality of time, the reality of, um, of, of, of interdependence. Um, and I was sort of riffing a little bit, I was sort of going off on Stanley Carvel's wonderful discussion about um, his reading of King Lear and, and sort of uh, a certain that what the thing that emerges in the in, in that in that play is that King Leah is sort of um, refuses to come to terms with um, or doesn't want to come to terms with being seen with the eyes of love, with being seen as he actually is, which is not just this, not 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 being seen as a great leader or a great king, but what he demands what he doesn't want to uh, sort of come to terms with is his his feebleness his um 
that he's he's grown old and and um he's become dependent um and that's one of the reasons then why he sort of um repudiates his daughter uh, Cordelia precisely because Cordelia wants to see or sees him for all for all his 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 his, his wonderfulness but also his faults as well and i would argue then that anti political systems are also these machineries for uh, refusing to see us for what we are refusing to see systems for what they are um by trying to sort of recover a lost wounded uh, a lost subject or a lost um fantasy that really has never existed um so chronotop chronotopian um uh, sort of forms of thinking are in a sense one part of it is a form a certain kind of reading but also a certain kind of practice um that on the one hand demands um an acknowledgement of realities that we don't want to acknowledge such as interdependence such as dependence such as um woundedness lostness um aloneness um and in that sense it's very existential but also i would argue um there there are forms of solidarity of of saying that you know uh, we don't have to sort of affirm our reality by disappearing anybody else thank you for that question i'll be thinking about it <laughs> okay another question could we think of chronotopia as a subversion of utopian imagination um, so not the utopianism caught up in a future one way forward as say Ursula Le, Le Guin has described as yin utopia that comes out of margins neg neg negations obscurities not by going forward uh, but by going roundabout or sideways could mm -hmm. chronotopia be thought of in this way that uh, reimagines reclaims the utopic imaginary as subversive um, as a subversive reappropriation re of utopia. Yes, um, <laughs> the question puts it much better than I could. I need to steal the, or at least borrow the, that language, which is beautiful. Yes, um, I would say, in many senses, I love the idea of it as subversion. Um, um, one, um, I think. You know, I talk a lot about the anti-utopian and the utopian, and um, sort of following James, the Jamesonian point here that um, capitalism does have a utopian promise, even though it never actually brings that about. But it does have a utopian promise, um, and uh, part part. Part of that, part of the work then would be, um, I suppose, um, subverting, um, subverting capitalism, subverting um, white supremacy and 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 patriarchy. Um, but I also love the question because it does indicate. Um, I love the idea of living sideways, of living, um, because for me, then it, it indicates that, again, that kind of futural thinking is not everything, um, that there is, um, we can now turn to actually existing formations in the refugee camp among the wageless, um, forms of care, for instance. Uh, and we do, we do know this happen all the time in terms of, um, um, you know, grandmas in the inner city taking care of, um, you know, not only their children, not only their grandchildren and so on, but, you know, people in the neighborhood. Um, we know these forms of care that are uh, fugitive in, in between, in between sort of the oppressive conditions of capitalism. And, and 
to that extent then, to that extent then, utopian, but not in the pejorative sense, utopian in the best sense of the term, that we can sort of see this fugitive utopianisms. And maybe another, another name for chronotopian is the fugitive utopianism. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that's already here. Right, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the important element as well. And I was thinking about, uh, also in, in your answer to the last question about, about linearity, the, the thing in common that the kind of, that the temporality of say, like uh, right-wing Christian movements have in common, this kind of uh, millenarian, like we're just gonna, we're just gonna like, you know, screw everybody over because, you know, it's gonna, you know, the Messiah is gonna come. It's all gonna, you know, we're going to be, we're going to get ours eventually, right? So anything we do is worth it, you know, and that's quite similar to a kind of capitalist progressive way of thought of like, you know, we're just gonna work, work, work because eventually our time's gonna come, right? So, but what, what those have in common and why they're so strong together is that there's a complete evacuation of the present, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so when we think about this, this fugitivity, it's, it's an acknowledgement of, the, of, what's, of what is here and what is present already, right? Well said, well said. And that reminds me that if anybody knows anything, again, um, my examples are coming from the US, which I don't always like, but again, I will say this, that if anybody knows anything about those millennial sort of forms of Christianity in the United States, for instance, right now what's going on is um, they can be deeply anti-Semitic, but, they, but, but um, precisely because they, they claim um, that they are, supportive of, say, the Israeli government, there is an interesting sort of um, symbiotic connection between the Israeli right uh, government and um, this Christian right formations in the United States, even though a lot of the Christian right formations, um, evangelical sort of formations can be deeply, deeply anti-Semitic, precisely because of that belief that in, in the future, they are going to, um, they need this, they need a certain kind of um, moment, a certain kind of future or history before the coming of um, their Messiah. I don't know if I have time to ask one more from the chat for one more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more that's, that's slightly combative, so that'll be a nice way to end. Um, there's a, it's a question about um, your bringing up the situation as international in terms of um, them kind of more recently being rethought of as kind of an anti-feminist movement. So um, what's maybe your, your engagement with them? And maybe if you could speak about that a little bit as well. Could you repeat that, Rachel? I, I, yeah. I'm not sure I got it. Um, just that you um, you mentioned as uh, one example of kind of creative creative thinking towards ungovernability, the situation is international, and so the question was around um, how I guess how we see them as an example, maybe today looking back at at, at their at at them in their moment as being kind of anti, as being anti-feminist, as being an anti-feminist movement. Um, you mean so how, is, is, did you say situationist? Yes, the situation oh, is international. Okay. Um, oh yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a, a good question. I don't. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not. I'm not embracing the entirety of of the of the situationist. Um, I, I see. Yeah, I see a lot. A lot there that is of use. But, but yes, I would be critical of, of their patriarchy. I would be critical of, um, of the macho masculine form, forms that are not, not only at sort of performed by somebody like Debo, but, but many, of, many, many in that collective. Um, I think, I, I think that I think that is embedded in sort of my my critique that a lot of my thinking is informed. Um, a lot of my thinking has been shaped by black feminism. So when I think when I'm when I'm thinking about the kinds of um, the kinds of praxis that I, I want to sort of enact and that I want to be in solidarity with, I'm thinking of people like. Um, 
in 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 places like Africa, that will be somebody like Sophie Oluwole. Um, that will be um, uh, Amina Mama in the United States. I would think of the likes of Joy James um, and Horton Spillers. Um, uh, across the world, I would think that black feminism, uh, radical feminism has, has shaped me. And so I, I, I'm not then always sort of, that's why I sort of want to move ac across these different scales. Um, and that's why I would be critical of any sort of idea, for instance, of, I was just reading a, a certain piece um, by, by uh, the philosophers, political philosophers, political theorists, Corey Robin and Alex Gurevich. And one of the arguments, one of the critiques I want to make of that piece is um, there's still sort of a fixation on a certain idea of the worker, the idea of um, the, the, the subject of the, rev the subject, the, the sort of the subject of um, the, the privileged subject of, of agency is still a certain idea of the worker. And if we can learn anything, I think, from um, much that's coming from a radical or critical as well as black feminisms, um, it's to expand our sort of ideas of um, the workings of capitalism, to think about um, forms of care work, um, to think about um, not only to think, not only to think in terms of certain sort of narrow notions of the economic, but how that is imbricated with the the political, the existential, the social, and so on. So, um, yeah, that just brings me to the idea that yes, I would affirm, I would, I would be, I would actually be very, up, um, I'm very critical of of this, of any social movement or any sort of aesthetic practice that doesn't that's not critical of, of how deeply sort of um, patriarchy imbricates and um, shapes um, those social formations and also shapes our practices. Um, and yes, the situation is international, I think will be um, ripe for critique on that front. Um, we should not shy away from critiquing them for that. Thank you. And should we wrap it up from there? Or Absolutely. Thank you, Omedi, for this remarkable and compelling talk. And thank you to you both, Omedi and Rachel, for this very illuminating conversation, um, which also yields, I think, many connections to the next Fragments of Repair gathering, which is taking place on Thursday, 10th of June. Um, it's, uh, we'll be having decolonial scholar Rolando Vasquez, who will give a talk on decolonizing aesthetics, um, titled On Decolonial Aesthesis. And this will be followed by a conversation between Vasquez and Francoise Vergès. So please join us then. Um, but for now, thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.